as we enter the final decade of our century, we find that undeniably we live in a time of amazement. Our nation is linked by steel rail. Steamships bring trade to our rivers. Our factories and mills bring forth fruits of invention. The western frontier has become less an outpost and more a settlement. Truly, these are promising times. In such a land of plenty, how can these conditions exist? The misery of the tenements, ill-clothed children hounded into near slavery in the employ of thankless factories. There is chronic unemployment, and still they come, seeking opportunity and finding only poverty and despair. War with England? Over 120 years ago, America broke the shackles of tyranny. Must we do so again for our Latin neighbor? Are the British so convinced of their rightness that there is no room for negotiation between their colony of Guiana and Venezuela? If not a state of war, then most certainly a state of tension exists between America and England. It was a time of great change for America. The country had not yet acquired its global view. The spirit of nationalism ran strong, and distrust of the British ran high. Against this backdrop, the Salvation Army, an organization started in England, was beginning work in America. The Salvation Army in America was led by Commanders Ballington and Maud Booth, the son and daughter-in-law of General William Booth, the Army's founder. Immediately request your mortgage new national headquarters building and send funds for use in foreign missions. Yours in Christ this Christmas season, General William Booth. Mortgage everything after we've worked so hard. Ballington, must this be so? I cannot believe it possible. Nor I. We must tell no one and look to God for guidance. He will show us an answer. To General William Booth, we respectfully remind you that the people of New York have given selflessly to raise funds necessary to build a headquarters free from debt. Thus, in good conscience, we cannot comply with your order. Welcome, 1896. I know not what you promise, but entrust you to the Lord. Your brother and sister will be here soon to discuss our decision. And what will be, will be as God has ordained. The General, our father, orders your immediate return to London. I'm sorry, I will not go. This is insubordination. You know what that means in the army. Dismissal, which I will accept. Oh, how easy it is for you to say. But it is a court-martial offense. I must prefer charges of insubordination and disrespect against you. I move that this court try you for your words. Colonel Nicholl is charged with the obligation to dismiss you from office and demand of you all of the property of the army in America. A successor will be appointed immediately. Very well, then. Let it mean dismissal. And so it began. The beginnings of what was to become one of the most effective social welfare movements in our country, the Volunteers of America. But the story takes root even earlier. In the mid-1800s, a small boy was growing up in the poor section of East London, and a small girl was being raised by her well-off family in southern England. Ballington Booth and Maud Charlesworth were both children of ministers. And though from different backgrounds, their lives would soon coincide and touch the lives of many for years to come. How different it was then. Street preaching in London was considered a jailable offense. But I resolved not to be overcome by such ignorant persecution and continued my tasks within the ranks of the army. My father had traded pulpits with the rector of an Anglican church in one of London's worst slums. Growing up, I spent many hours with my mother leading Bible classes in the rectory kitchen. I spent Sundays teaching poor children from the neighborhood the power of reading and the kindness of God's love. As I recall, it was at an army holiness meeting that we first met. I was 16. Yes. And there was an earnest souled young man there who made an impassioned appeal to Christians to make their Christianity a vital thing by true consecration to God's service. From the first time I met him, I believe that from that moment on, I loved him. We were married five years later, and shortly thereafter were posted to America. That was 1887. We arrived to find the Americans looking with great distrust to this English Salvation Army. I realized early on that for our mission to be successful, we had to adapt to the ways of the populace. 
There were times when the persecution and ridicule became nearly intolerant, but we persevered, and in the span of seven years made great progress. By now it was 1894, and my father, General Booth, arrived for a triumphal tour of the United States. I'm afraid all did not go well. The general was displeased to see the eagle replacing the crown on the army shield and the Union Jack replaced by the Stars and Stripes. This was much too American for his tastes. I imagine it was inevitable that we should part ways that February of 1896, for we had become very American in our thoughts. It would seem that the gift of charity does not always apply to the organizations that espouse it. Witness the shameful dismissal of Mr. and Mrs. Ballington Booth from their positions within the Salvation Army. However, the light of righteousness still burns brightly, as demonstrated last night in Cooper Union, as the Booths inaugurated a new religious movement with the support of over 7,000 faithful. We thank thee for the privilege of meeting under these circumstances. We meet not to engender strife and ill feeling, but to those eternal subjects that shall help our souls. It is quite true that after serious thought and careful deliberation, we have resolved to inaugurate a new movement. We have resolved that the consecration we shall undertake shall be lasting. I want to assure Mrs. Booth and those officers who have taken a stand by me that with faith I see in the distant future a movement that we will not regret having linked our names with. I am glad to be here tonight. I believe, with the help of God, that whatever be the mission, we will take the right stand and be blessed. In its first issue on April 11, 1896, the Volunteers Gazette gave official name to the Volunteers of America. We are soldiers, fighters. Ours is a tent life, and we realize that it is our supreme calling to be ever on the march to redeem and save others who live in need and despair. It was just the beginning. Starting a new movement preoccupied our every thought. Day and night public meetings were held to enroll volunteer recruits. Posts were rapidly established from coast to coast. In six months' time, we had 140 posts with 400 commanding officers, 50 staff officers, three regiments, and 10 battalions. Ballington was elected president and general, and I vice president. Our new constitution proved quite progressive for the time. It provided that a woman be recognized as a man's equal and be entitled to the same privileges in the organization. 1896 was an extraordinary year. By summer, the Volunteers of America in Chicago directed an annual picnic for the city's poor children. Over 10,000 were fed. News of the event quickly spread to Cleveland, where an additional 900 children were treated. For Thanksgiving and Christmas that year, the officers and I began gathering food and toys to give to thousands of poor families. Many cities served holiday meals that season. This practice of serving dinners and distributing baskets of food, toys, and clothing at Christmas spread to nearly every volunteer post in the country. With joy, I helped Ballington in all the volunteer activities, yet I longed for special work of my own. Remembering the terrible needs of men in a prison I had visited a year earlier, I hoped to do something to meet those men's needs. If God wanted me to serve in the prison field, he would open the way. I waited and prayed for guidance. It was late spring, but a few months after the formation of the volunteers, when I received a curious letter from a young man I had met in the slums. It seems he had been sentenced to a term in Sing Sing prison and wrote me to beg help for his wife. All prison mail was subject to censorship, and as I turned the letter over, I saw another's handwriting. It was the warden of the prison requesting me to come speak to the men in the prison chapel. I replied immediately and soon found myself walking through cold ashen cells. They were dark and dank, filled with tuberculars. Enforced silence was punctuated only by the lockstep beat of striped uniform marches. That day I wondered what I might say to these forgotten men. I realized what they needed from my lips were not words that would more forcibly impress on them their sin and misery, but something that would carry their thoughts beyond the gray walls. I cannot remember exactly what I said, I think that day the dear Christ himself spoke to many hearts. 
From my first visit, letters began to find their way to me in steady quantities. I returned again and again, and always with the promise that if no one else in the outside world cares for you, write to me as a mother who loves you, and I will answer. Unofficially, throughout the prison world, I received a cherished title as the Little Mother. By fall, we had established Hope Hall, a place where ex-prisoners without homes or friends could find both until work could be found. Hope Hall No. 1 was a large Victorian mansion located in the Bronx, and unlike an institution, was informal and homey. There were but a few simple rules. No liquor, basic work around the house, lots of time for reading and recreation, and daily prayers. Before the end of 1896, Hope Hall No. 2 was opened in San Francisco, and many others were to follow. Over the years, our continued efforts led to the abolishment of the silent system, locked steps, stripes, ball and chain, and the introduction of radios to many state and federal prisons. Nothing is more powerful than the will of God and the belief in the goodness of man and his ability to help those of lesser fortune. How quickly, in less than the brief span of a year, we have seen the fruits of our mission. But there is so much more to do. My friends, as I stand before you here today, I am reminded of a story of a fashionable, richly dressed lady who dropped a jewel from her finger into the gutter in Paris. Unable to recover it any other way, she took off her glove, rolled back her lace sleeve, and probed the muck with her hand until she found the jewel. That is what the volunteers of America are doing, removing from our hands the glove of caste, searching the filth and slime of the gutter for human souls, God's jewels. That, my friends, is just what the volunteers of America are doing every day and every night, reaching down into the depths of human depravity and rescuing men and women from the chains and fetters that bind them. They are enabled to do this by the power from above, the power that is divine. For you cannot talk to a man about God when he is hungry and half clothed. You have to feed and clothe him first. Never think of your work as a job. It is a call from on high to his service. Always remember the sacredness of your mission. Let the work of the volunteers of America be always to fulfill the words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bound. <laughs>